Our Heavenly Father, we give you honor and praise as one body of Christ, union with Christ Community Church. Lord, we declare that we believe that only expository preaching accomplishes the call to proclaim the whole counsel of God. And Lord, we praise you because expository preaching is the foundation of all the ministries of UCC Church. Father, we praise you because the word of the Lord is upright. We praise you because all your work is done in faithfulness. We praise you, O God, because you love righteousness and justice. And we praise you because the earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. We praise you as well because by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of your mouth, O God, all their host. Lord, you gather the waters of the sea as a heap. And Lord, you put the deeps in storehouses. Lord, we thank you because you call all the earth to fear you, O God. And so, Lord, we pray that we as your inhabitants of the world, may we stand in awe of you. Lord, because you spoke and it came to be. You commanded and it stood firm. We praise you because you are our creator. You designed us. Lord, you gave us life. And Lord, we just want to declare that you are our God. You are a loving God. You are a gracious God. You are merciful, full of compassion. And so as we gather today as your family, Lord, we pray that you would continue to prepare our hearts. Father, if there be any sin in our hearts, Lord, I pray that you would just convict us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us, Lord, to just confess all of our sins to you and declare, O oh God, that apart from you, we are nothing. Unless we confess our sins, there will be a barrier in our communion, communion with you today. So we pray that through the blood of Jesus Christ, shed on the cross of Calvary, cleanse our hearts, grant us clean hearts so that we may be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, as a church, we continue to pray for the needs of our church. We pray for our dear pastor, Billy. Lord, we pray for him. We thank you because you are continually sustaining him. Lord, we pray for him that may you grant him full recovery by your grace, for your glory, for your honor. We pray that there will be no more infections and complications moving forward, Father. Lord, we thank you because his disposition is much better than when he was in the hospital. And for this, we give you praise and thanks. Lord, continue to raise him back, Lord, to fullness of health, Father, for your glory and honor. We also pray for the Archaean family. Continue to provide them, Lord, emotional strength, Comfort, wisdom, Lord, in all the decisions that they have to make on behalf of Pastor Billy. We also pray, Father, that you would continue to provide financially to the family. Pray for the nurses and caregivers, Lord, that they will be able to take good care of Pastor Billy. And pray that you would also supply them good health and safety while they travel. We also pray for Teacher Joy San Juan. Lord, we continue to entrust to you, Lord, her condition. We pray for her cardiologist, that uh, her cardiologist will be able to find out what's causing her irregular blood pressure, as well as the heaviness that she feels on her heart. Lord, thank you for the good results, Lord, of the stress test and to the echo. And we pray that you would continue to heal her completely, use the medications, to heal her high cholesterol and high uric acid. We also pray for Sister Sally's cardiologist that, Lord, that she would, that the doctor will be able to diagnose her well and grant her clearance for shockwave therapy to remove the stones from her kidney. We continue to pray for Sister Nina Ang Chai, continue to grant her health and recovery. Pray for Kari San Juan for her health. Pray for favorable lab results as well. We pray for the healing of Mila Chua Gruba as she has AML. We also pray for the CEDs as the church prepares and plans 
for UCC Church for 2024. Above all, we just want to give you thanks for calling us to be part of your church, UCC Church family. Continue to use this church, not just to bless us, but may we be a blessing to society for your glory and honor. In Christ's name, we pray all these things with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Our sermon passage for today is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 15. There is no need for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people. For I know your eagerness, earn, eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you in Archaea were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready, and as I said, you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangement for the generous gift you had promised. Then it would be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous in every occasion. And through, through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved, proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The sermon topic for today is entitled The Ministry of, to the Saints. That's part three. Let's give the rest of the time to our speaker. Pastor Keith Ibrahim. Great to see all of you this morning. And today we're going to finish our little mini series from 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. And as you see, the title of this series has been called uh, The Ministry to the Saints, because that's exactly what Paul is uh, writing about. Uh, I see uh, a number of faces that uh, haven't been able to be with us the last week or two, so I want to begin with a little bit of a review just so that everyone will be uh, caught up to speed, so to speak, as to uh, where we are uh, in our study. Uh, we saw in our introduction that the believers in Jerusalem at this time were very, very poor. And they were poor because of a famine and because of persecution. And before Paul left on his second missionary journey, Peter, James, and John asked him to remember the poor saints in Jerusalem, and Paul wrote in Galatians that he was very eager to do that. And the way Paul was going to practically remember these poor believers in Jerusalem was to take an offering from the Gentile churches in Galatia, and in Greece, both Macedonia, northern Greece, and Achaia, southern Greece. 
And so he's writing to the Corinthians to give them instructions about uh, the offering. Uh, We have also seen that when Paul was in Ephesus for three years, uh, he had written the letter of 1 Corinthians where he gave them instructions about this offering. They knew about it, and they expressed a tremendous desire to be a part of it in order to help uh, the saints in Jerusalem. And Paul had sent Titus to Corinth, and the Corinthians uh, met with Titus and gave him a good report, and so Titus met up with Paul in Macedonia. And so Paul is in Macedonia when he wrote this. The Macedonian churches were Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. So Paul is up there. He's about to come down to Corinth. But before he does, he writes this letter of 2 Corinthians. He gives it to Titus and two other unnamed brethren. And they went ahead so that the Corinthians would be prepared when Paul arrived to give the offering. And then they would take it uh, to Jerusalem to the poor saints there. And so now as we pick it up in chapter 3, Paul is going to give them again a few more uh, instructions about this offering and uh, as he closes uh, this section of the book. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll ask the Lord to once again uh, enable us to understand his word. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the things we've been learning the last couple of weeks and Now as we come to chapter 9 and look at these verses once again, we confess our absolute total dependence on your Holy Spirit to understand the meaning of what Paul wrote. Help us to understand and then help us to put into practice the principles that we learn so that we will glorify you in our lives. So we commit this time into your hands and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now in the first five verses of chapter 9, what we're going to see is Paul again is writing about this collection uh, for the saints. And in verse 1, he wrote this. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, and right? In other words, the offering for the poor believers in Jerusalem. Concerning this, he says, it is superfluous for me to write to you. The word superfluous means unnecessary. It's not really needed that I write to you about this. And the reason why is in verse 2. He says, I really don't need to write to you about this offering because I know your willingness. Again, a year earlier, the Corinthians had expressed a tremendous desire and willingness to give for this offering to help those believers. And then he says, I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians. Wow. Paul used the tremendous desire of the Corinthians in order to motivate the Macedonian believers to take part. And the interesting thing we already saw in chapter 8 is he uses the generous offering of the Macedonians to then encourage the Corinthians uh, to participate. So Paul is very shrewd uh, in his writings here. And so he says, I know your willingness. I boast of you to the Macedonians that Achaia, southern Greece, Corinth, was ready a year ago. And your zeal has stirred up the majority. So the majority of the Macedonians now really wanted to give because they heard that the Corinthians uh, really wanted to give. And so they were ready a year ago. We saw this last week in chapter 8, verse 10, where Paul wrote, and in this I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago. So you see, he again had mentioned the fact that they had been ready for a year. 1 Corinthians, which was written a year before this, he had given them instructions. And we had looked at these verses before. Now concerning the collection for the saints in Jerusalem, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. 
on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, let each one of you lay something aside. So out of your income for the week, put something aside on Sunday, storing up as he may prosper, as the Lord prospers you, store some away, that there be no collections when I come. See, he wanted the offering to be prepared ahead of time. He says, and when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. So the Corinthians were very much ready and, uh, to give, and so Paul had used that to motivate the Macedonians. But now in verses 3 and 4, <laughs> he's also writing to them because he wants to prevent his boast from being empty, and he didn't want the, mass, uh, the Corinthians and himself to be humiliated, to lose face if they came and they were not prepared for the offering. Paul had been boasting about the Corinthians. They're ready. They're willing. So if they arrive and they're not, boy, <laughs> embarrassment, right? Humiliation. And Paul's boast was, was an empty boast. And so in verse 3, he wrote this. Yet I have sent the brethren. And who are the brethren? Titus and the two unnamed brothers that we talked about last week, right? From Corinth. I mean, from Macedonia. So he sends the three, lest our boasting of you should be in vain. <laughs> Again, if you're not ready, my boasting about you will have been for nothing. That, as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and they find you unprepared, what's that going to be like? We, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. So you see, he had sent Titus and the other two so that they would be prepared, so that when Paul and others arrived a little bit later, nobody would be embarrassed, his boasting would not have been for nothing, and the Corinthians would have been prepared uh, to give a generous offering. Right? In verse 5, we see there, Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren... Titus and the other two unnamed brethren, to go to you ahead of time. So Titus carried the letter of 2 Corinthians, and he went ahead of Paul in order to prepare. And prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised. He reminds them that a year earlier they had promised, and they were wanting to do this. So now they needed to have it prepared when he arrived that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. You see, Paul wasn't just interested in the gift. Paul knew that God is also interested in the motive of giving and why we give and how we give. And he didn't want to arrive and them to give grudgingly grudgingly, as an obligation. Oh, well, I guess I have to give to this uh, because Paul had boasted about me. And you know, we need to be very careful that whenever we give to anything uh, for the Lord, that we don't do it grudgingly, but as a matter of generosity, willingly. And so Paul, again, is encouraged then to be prepared. Now, did the Corinthians prepare the offering, and were they ready when he arrived? Yes, we know that because in Romans chapter 15, Paul wrote Romans when he arrived in Corinth. And in Romans 15 verse 26, he wrote, For it pleased those from Macedonia and where? Uh, Achaia, there are the Corinthians there. So it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia, to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints or who are in Jerusalem. So the Corinthians came through with their promise. Paul's letter and encouragement had its effect. 
Titus and the brethren went down. They were prepared so that when Paul came, they took a wonderful, generous offering. And everybody was happy to do it and not doing it uh, grudgingly. So this was uh, the collection for the saints. But now in verses 6 and 7, what Paul does is he gives five principles for giving, all right? We're going to see five different principles in these two verses. The first principle we see in verse 6, and he says this, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, this is uh, known as the law of the harvest. If you are a farmer and you go and you plant seed, but you're very stingy and you only plant a little bit of seed, then you're only going to get a little bit of crop at the time of harvest. That makes sense. But if you are a diligent farmer and you plant a lot of seed, then you are going to have a larger harvest. And so Paul is using this uh, from farming as an illustration to show that we reap what we sow. And we, if we sow and if we give bountifully, then the Lord is the one who replenishes that which we give away. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself said in Luke 6, 38, Give, Jesus said, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. And so Jesus says, you give, and don't worry, God is going to replenish that, and probably even more than what you had given away. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So the Lord is the one who provides us with the means to be able to give in the first place. And when we give, he is the one who enables us by replenishing what we give so that we can give again. It's the law of the harvest. So principle number one, we see that we reap what we sow. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24. It says, there is one, one person, who scatters, yet he increases more. And there is one who withholds what is right, but it leads to poverty. Well, amazing uh, proverb. Again, with the same principle of reaping what we sow. The one who scatters will increase, and the one who withholds will come to poverty. In chapter 22 of Proverbs, verse 9, he who has a generous eye will be blessed, blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. He gives of his bread to the poor. So again, principle number one in verse 6, we see that we reap what we sow, the law of the harvest. Verse 7 And we're going to be on this verse for a little while because we see four different principles right in this verse. The first one is, give as your heart desires. So let each one gives as he purposes in his heart. We have already talked about the fact two weeks ago that the New Testament does not teach required giving, required tithing. The New Testament teaches that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength, love our neighbor as ourselves, and then give whatever you want to give, whatever you want. And so whatever you purpose in your heart, you want to give this much, fine, give that much. You want to give this much, fine, give that much. Whatever you purpose in your heart, give as your heart desires. Now, I'd like to tell you about a man in the U.S. Uh, His name is Stanley Tam. Have any of you have heard of Stanley Tam? 
Stanley Tam was a Christian businessman in Ohio. And he st I just found out that a couple of months ago, he went home to be with the Lord at 107 years old. <laughs> Stanley Tam. And Stanley Tam started a business in Ohio in the U.S. It was called uh, U.S. Plastics. And Stanley Tam wrote a book that I've read entitled, God Owns My Business. God Owns My Business. And what he did was, when he set up his business, all right, at the beginning, 10% of every bit of profit that the company made went to the Lord's work. Missionaries, churches, whatever, uh, different projects, things of the Lord. 10%. 90% went back into the company to build the company. That's what you do at the beginning. But as the company grew, he began to add the, to the percentage given to the Lord. And when he incorporated the church... He had a hard time finding a lawyer willing to do it because he made his business partner in ownership God on, on the legal document. He was one owner and the other owner was God. And God was made 51% of the stocks of the company. And he started a non-profit uh, organization, and so 51% of all the profits that the company made went to God, went to this nonprofit corporation through which it was dispersed. Again, missionaries, uh, churches, all kinds of Christian ministries that needed financial help. As the Lord began to prosper his business, eventually he got to the, it became a multi-million dollar company. And it got to the point where he was giving 90% of the profits of the company to God. To God. And it's estimated that in his lifetime, from his company, $140 million went out to the Lord's work all over the world. Why? Because he wanted to. Because that's what he purposed in his heart. Lord, you're my partner. You get 10% as we grow. We get 50, you get over 51% and eventually 90% because there's so much extra. And not only that, but Stanley Tam had a tremendous zeal for evangelism. He would evangelize all of his workers in his company, and he would send gospel tracts to all his clients. <laughs> I mean, th this man was really, really amazing. And so, you know, often in the church we get hung up on 10%, uh, well, I got to give 10%, and anything above that is a free will offering. No, 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 no. Nowhere does the Bible teach that. The Bible always teaches in the New Testament, give what you want. Keep your heart right with God, and then give what you want, whatever you purpose in your heart. And do it with joy, with generosity, right? That's it. And so the first, uh, second principle we saw, we saw reap what we sow in verse 6, then give as your heart desires, verse 7. Now we look at another one here in verse 7. So let each one give as he purpose in his heart, not grudgingly. In other words, not with grief, not with sorrow, not with sadness. Well, I guess I'm a Christian. I guess I got to give to this. <laughs> or give to that, all right? Not with, with reluctantly or grudgingly. Don't give that way. Don't give that way. Guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. Don't give grudgingly. But the next, the fourth, we see, or of necessity, not out of necessity. In other words, not under compulsion, not because you feel you have to. I'm going to give this because I have to. That's not the heart. That's not the motive. 
that glorifies God, that pleases God. When we give to anything, whether it be to other believers in need, whether it be to our local church, whether it be to missionaries overseas, whatever Christian ministry or people that we minister to, don't give it grudgingly or because you think you have to, because you don't have to. If you don't want to give anything, if that's the purpose of your heart, then don't give anything. Better examine your heart <laughs> because there's a problem there. But uh, yeah. well, has a purpose in your heart. And then finally, the last one, for God loves a, I uh, know, cheerful giver. Uh, many Bible teachers have pointed out that this word means to give hilariously, right? Uh, to give with great joy. You are just hilariously happy and full of joy that you have the privilege to be able to give to help other believers, the church of Jesus Christ, missions, whatever, whatever it is. So give cheerfully and give joyfully. Well, now in verses 8 and 11, he's going to repeat the point that the Lord is the one who provides us with the ability, with the means to give, and he is also the one who will replenish whatever it is we give away. Whatever it is we give away. Verse 8, and God is able. Is God able? Yes, he's able to make all grace abound toward you. Now, in the context, the grace is talking about finances. Finances. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Why? So, so that you, having always having all sufficiency in all things, you have plenty for yourself, may have an abundance for every good work. So again, God blesses us so that we can bless others. And then in return, he blesses us some more, so then we bless others again. We bless others again. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, it says this in the Mosaic Law, verses 7 and 8. If there is among you a poor man of your brethren, Jewish brother, poor, with any of the gate, within any of the gates in your land, which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother. But you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. And by the way, even though he says lend them, remember that in the Mosaic law, they were not allowed to charge interest <laughs> when they lended money to other Jews. So lend, lend it. Even better, just give it to them. Give it to them, right? Don't withhold the blessing to them. Then he says this, you shall surely give to him. And your heart should not be grieved when you're given to him. Oh, man, I really don't want to do this. I'm sad. I'm... Because of this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and in all to which you put your hand. And so again, we see the Lord is the one who blesses and again replenishes by blessing the work of our hands. We saw that with Stanley Tam for sure as an illustration on how the Lord just continued to bless his business in order for him to be able to continue to be a, a blessing uh, to others, a blessing to others. For the poor will never cease from the land. You always have other believers in need, always. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land, in land. And we always need to remember Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, which says this, you shall remember, don't forget, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get what? To get wealth. The Lord is the one who gives us power or ability to get wealth. The Lord is the one who's given us our talents, 
our mind, our abilities. And the only reason why any of us can earn any money in any way is because the Lord gives us the power to do it and the abilities. And that same God who gave us the abilities so that we can earn, so that we can meet the need of others, will also replenish it after we give it. Then in verse 9, he says, As it is written, and this is actually a quote from Psalm 112, verse 9. In Psalm 112, verse 9, it says this, He, the Lord, has dispersed abroad... He has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. The Lord is the one who disperses. The Lord is the one who gives. And he is very, very pleased to do that through his people, through his people. So the Lord is our faithful provider. Verses 10 and 11. Now, this verse here, uh, verse uh, 10, as we're going to see, it's an allusion. He's alluding to a verse in Isaiah, in Isaiah 55, verse 10. But he says here in verse 9, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower, and of course it's God, God is the one who provides the seed for the farmers, and bread for food, Supply and multiply the seed you have sown through the offering to the saints and increase the fruits of your righteousness. And so he says, may God, the one who provides, the one who supplies, may he multiply that gift that you've given and may he increase the fruits of righteousness that are in your life. Again, this is allusion to over in Isaiah 55, verse 10, where it says, For as the rain comes down, sent by the Lord, obviously, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So again, just as the rain comes down and the dew and the snow, it waters the earth and again, in order to give seed and the eater. But the Lord is the one uh, who does this. So God supplies and he replenishes our needs. And the result of that we see in verse 11. The result of their generous offering He says, while you are enriched in everything, all right, they were enriched in everything, for all liberality. You've been blessed so you can give it away (laughs) to meet the needs of others, right? To support the church. You are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes what? What's the end result? Thanksgiving through us to God. So God gets thanksgiving. He gets praise. He gets glory. Because God is the one who is glorified when everyone is giving him thanks for blessing us and for the blessing of others. The last couple of verses, verses 12 to 14, what Paul writes about is the four different responses of the Jewish believers in Jerusalem when they received this offering. Remember, they're destitute. And when Paul and the Corinthians and the Macedonians arrived with this extremely generous gift, how were those believers in Jerusalem going to respond? Well, we'll see four ways. Number one, they gave thanksgiving to God. Verse 12, for the administration of this service, it not only supplies the needs of those Jerusalem believers, but also is abounding through many what? Thanksgivings to God. Can you imagine the faces of the, of the destitute believers in Jerusalem when they see them come with this love gift from the Gentile churches? They were just thanking God over and over and over again for helping them and meeting their need. 
uh, through these Gentile uh, believers. So the first response of the Jewish believers in Jerusalem was to give thanksgiving to God. Verse 13. Secondly, they're going to give glory to God. Well, through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ. You see, through this offering, all right, the believers were proving their obedience to their confession to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. And they gave glory to God. Those, Jeru those Jerusalem believers were just so thankful to thank God and to glory of, give glory to God. Why? For your liberal sharing with them and all men. Did you ever help somebody in need and they just are overwhelmed with thanksgiving for, for your help? And, you're give, and they thank God, and they give God glory to God for you, for your generosity, for helping. That would be the response of the believers in Jerusalem. Not only that, verse 14, we see two other responses of the Jerusalem church. It says, and by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Two things. The Jerusalem believers began praying for the Gentile believers, praying for them. Again, so thankful, so grateful that prayers were going up to God on behalf of those who gave. And not only that, the Jerusalem believers long to see them. They really wanted to see. Remember, they didn't have a messenger or something where they could video chat <laughs> from Jerusalem uh, to Greece. But they, they earnestly, sincerely prayed for the Macedonian believers, prayed for the Corinthian believers, and they wanted to see them. They wanted to be with them, to fellowship with them. And again, to thank them, thank them. And all of this brings great glory and praise and honor to God, to God. Well, the last verse, Paul ends this section, these two chapters about this offering, this ministry to the saints, by closing it by reminding them of God's giving to us. And he says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable, inexpressible gift, the gift of salvation, the for gift of forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life that is ours. That gift is so far greater than any gift we can give to the church or anyone else. It's indescribable. It's inexpressible. There's no words that you can use to convey <laughs> the greatness and the awesomeness of the gift of salvation that we have received in Jesus Christ. So great, can't even begin to be expressed or described. So beloved, sometimes, you know, Linda and I were talking about this, sometimes messages on giving, you know, we'll take a, just a couple verses out of here and, you know, beat people over the head with it. <laughs> But, you know, that's not what this is all about. This was all about meeting real needs of real believers and realizing that we have a joy and a privilege to be able to do this and that God provides for us so that we can provide for others and that God replenishes whatever it is that we give so that we can give more. And when we all have this kind of heart, and we all love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength, when we all love our neighbor as ourselves, then God is glorified, and there is much thanksgiving that goes up to his praise 
and to his glory. May we all put into practice uh, these principles and just be thankful for our salvation and for the pr privilege to be able to give for those in need and for the furtherance of the gospel. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word today. Thank you for the way you provided for those believers in Jerusalem through the Gentile churches. And thank you for Paul and Titus and the other brethren and their concern. And thank you that you were glorified. And thank you that all of those Gentile believers responded in faith and in love and gave generously. Just pray that you would help us to guard our hearts. May we give as we purpose in our heart and pray that you would continue to provide for each one of us to meet our needs and also to provide the needs of the church and others that are in need. We thank you and we praise you for the privilege and joy to be your children and to participate in the furtherance of the gospel. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.